school kindergarten can go right here where Becky is to that door first through sixth grade. Follow Jane. She's got goodies in her hands too. I think I'll go there. And, uh, and let's see, I think the middle school, high schoolers, Jim, are you taking, where is Jim? Is he taking him out today? There he is. Follow Jim out there as well. And you guys turn to Matthew chapter eight, verses one through four. So this is our, basically our final message in this series of why Jesus and why follow him, why trust him, why do we give our lives to him? And the answer for that is because Jesus is able to do some things that no other person, no other religious teacher, no other philosopher, no other counselor, psychologist, therapist, no other scientist, no other political leader could ever do. Uh, for instance, we've talked about how Jesus can calm our storms. He can drive away the devil. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He died for us last week. We celebrate, celebrate how he lives for us. He rose from the dead. And... Uh, you know, and by the way, that's a pretty good reason, you know, to follow Jesus. That's why we follow Jesus. But today, we're going to talk about how Jesus can save us from ourselves. And that is really a good reason to follow Jesus. And so let's read this story. And, and to do this, we're going to look at a miracle, a healing that Jesus performed. And uh, it, it, you'll see how this, this fits. So in Matthew 8, when he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. That's the story. Pretty powerful. And uh, instantaneously, healing someone from leprosy is, you know, a pretty amazing miracle. When you think about it, I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine seeing that. And, but there's more to this miracle than meets the eye. In fact, there's more to all of Jesus' healing and miracles than meets the eye. What I want you to understand is that all the miracles, that, the physical miracles that Jesus performed represent a deeper, greater miracle that God does in our lives. Just understand this. For instance, the uh, feeding of the 5,000, pretty cool miracle. I mean, we're just blown away by that. Feeding 5,000 people with just, you know, a few loaves and fish. But understand that miracle represents a, a greater miracle of feeding us spiritually. And that's, that's bigger. It's greater. Healing someone of blindness, pretty amazing, you know, physical miracle. But that represents how Jesus cures spiritual blindness as well. Talk about physical storms. He calms, he calms storms in our lives. You can look at all those miracles and understand that underneath every miracle that Jesus performed, there's a deeper miracle that God, Jesus, performs at the spiritual level. And that's the greater miracle. And this miracle is no difference. Leprosy is the same. First, understand that leprosy was one of the most feared and devastating illnesses a person could have in New Testament times. Okay, but leprosy also best exemplifies how sin works in our lives at the spiritual level. And we're just going to see that. And so the healing of the physical healing of the leper is great, but the spiritual healing it represents is even more amazing. And again, we'll see how leprosy is most, one of the most graphic illustrations of how sin operates. So let's look at our story in a little more detail. Verse 2 says, a man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So out of 61 defilements, the Jewish law listed, leprosy was second to the worst. The very worst being touching a dead body. Okay, so you're, if you're a leper, it's bad news. We have treatments today for leprosy. They had nothing back then. So if you contracted leprosy, you, you were basically given a... a a long, slow, torturous, torturous death sentence. That's what it was in those days. There's different kinds of leprosy, but this is probably what is now called Hansen's disease. It essentially attacks the nerve endings and nervous system in the body, causing serious deform deformation of the body and body parts, losing body parts until they just become stumps. And uh, it's just a slow, torturous, human, dehumanizing way to die. In Luke's account of this story, uh, Luke says he's completely covered with leprosy. So this guy probably looked pretty bad. And he's coming before Jesus. And to make matters worse, in those days, 
leprosy was viewed as a judgment from God. So that if you were a leper, that's because you were a bad person. You were a sinner and God was punishing you. That's how they viewed it. So, you know, you, man, if you're a leper, it's not just that you're sick. You're just an evil, bad person and you deserve it. And so you're contaminated, you're contagious. It was bad. And you're not just sick, you're unclean, filthy, dirty. And for this reason, leprosy had an even greater devastating effect in that it alienated the leper from all human contact. You know, because you're contagious. Well, first off, when your limbs are rotting away, you're not a very pleasant person to be around. So no one's going to want to be around you, but you're also contagious. So people didn't want to touch you. And so Jewish law forbid lepers to become within 30, 40 feet of people without yelling, unclean, unclean, to warn people. You know, you just couldn't allow it. In fact, if the wind was blowing, you could, a leper couldn't be within 150 feet of some people. I mean, it's just, and so they lived in colonies, you lived by yourself. You were basically banished from all social contact. And so can you imagine what that must have been like? That's what this guy was experiencing. So the first thing to notice about this story is how this man covered with leprosy completely ignored the rules. Completely just said, I don't care what the law says. I'm going to Jesus to get healing because he believed Jesus could heal him. And I got to think that's a good example for us because no, so, no rule or social law or social pressure was going to keep this guy from getting to Jesus. What's going to keep you from getting to Jesus? Because if you're coming to Jesus, you're going to have friends, you're going to have family, you're going to have all sorts of social pressure, media pressure, not to go to Jesus. This man didn't care because he knew he had a problem that only Jesus could heal. He went to Jesus, knelt right before him. But what's even more striking is Jesus' response. Look at verse 3. I love this. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, he was cured of his leprosy. So here's this deadly, contagious, repugnant leper kneeling right before him. Jesus is not even phased. Doesn't care one bit. He's not repulsed. No, in fact, <laughs> he reaches out and he touches the, touches the man. You're not supposed to touch lepers. Let me ask you, if you had a, a leper covered with leprosy, you know, and he's just, they don't look very nice. Probably smells worse. Would you touch him? Would you touch him? Jesus <laughs> reaches out and touches this man. You know, Jesus was always breaking the rules to touch people. I mean, you know, here's a Jewish man talking to a, a Samaritan who you're not supposed to associate, and a woman. Jews weren't supposed to do that. He was doing that. Matthew, a tax collector. You're not supposed to mess with the tax collectors. Jesus even interacted and did healings for Gentiles. Your Jews were especially not to talk to Gentiles. I mean, you could go down the list. Jesus didn't care about social customs. He's about touching people and healing them. And so here's Jesus touching this leper. And we need to appreciate how radically profound this was. So Dr. Paul Brand was a renowned expert, was a renowned expert on leprosy. And he was in India one time attending to a patient, and he laid his hand on this leper's shoulder and explained to him the treatment he was undergo, to undergo. And to his surprise, the moment he laid his hand on his shoulder, this, this leper just began sobbing uncontrollably. And doc, Dr. Paul Brand said, to his translator, did I say something? Did I do something wrong? And the translator talked to the man and says, no, Dr. Brand, the reason he's crying is that when you laid on his shoulder, that's the first human touch he's had in many, many years. And you see, Jesus not only healed this man of the leprosy, he healed him from that exile, the banishment. Jesus brought him back into human contact. And that's what Jesus does. That's what the touch of Jesus does. And so keep that in mind. And notice also when this man said to Jesus, if you're willing, you can make me clean, Jesus responded, I'm willing. You know, don't, let's not gloss over this. Jesus is willing to heal this man. That means he wants to. What we're seeing here is Jesus' love for a leper. He loved the man. And, uh, you know, we're seeing God's love for a person on the lowest rung of society's, you know, ladder. And so it doesn't matter how far down on the ladder you are. Does he get that? He doesn't care. 
He loves. He loves us all. And then, of course, there's just the healing itself. Jesus simply says, be clean. And the guy is instantaneously cured. I, you know, I, can you wrap your head around that? I wish I could see something like that. Because that means you're, you're looking at stuff that blows our mind away. This isn't one of the TV evangelists' trick, you know, be healed or, you know, slain people. All of a sudden, something's happening right in front of your eyes that you can't deny. And this man is completely and wholly healed. That's amazing. That's one of the reasons I want to follow Jesus. Pretty reason. Yeah. But how does this relate? This miracle relate to me and Jesus saving me from myself because that is the real miracle. Remember, all these miracles have a deep meaning. Leprosy is the same way. What is striking is how leprosy parallels how sin works in our lives. Josephus, Jewish historian, used to say, well, he actually said that Lepers were treated as the walking dead. They were objects of wrath. That's the Jewish historian. Take a look at Ephesians chapter 2. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work, and those who are disobedient. All of us also lived at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and violence his desires and thoughts like the rest. We were by nature objects of wrath. Basically, sin makes us into the walking dead. It makes us into objects of wrath. We're just no different than a dead person walking. Sin is basically spiritual leprosy. Sin works in our lives the same way leprosy works in the human body. So leprosy attacks the nervous system, the nerve endings, so that you can't feel anything. You can't, you just, you know, you go numb. And so we gradually but slowly lose all of the five senses. Okay, and then first fingers, then toes, then hands and feet, arms, legs, eyesight, hearing, smell, taste disappear. Sin affects us the same way. It attacks our spiritual nerve endings so that we lose sensitivity to spiritual things. And uh, this means, you know, just like leprosy takes away pain, pain receptors are deadened in, in leprosy. And you may think that's a good thing, but you realize pain is a gift. When we feel pain, we know we've hurt ourselves. We're doing harm to ourselves. And so what we this, you know, God gave us pain as a warning system. And when leprosy occurs, it first shows up as wounds or ulcers on the body. And because the leper doesn't feel it, the infection runs its course. And it basically is why the limb gets infected and rots away. But what they finally figured out is the initial ulcers and wounds aren't caused by the leprosy either. What's happening is because people lose the sensitivity, they find out we, they're hurting themselves and not knowing it. So as one person put it, if an ankle is turned, tearing a tendon and muscle, the leper would just adjust and walk crooked, injuring it even more. Oh, I love this one. If a rat chewed off a finger in the night, the leper would not discover it until the next morning. How about this? One man went blind because he washed his face every morning. What he did not know, he was using scalding hot water. Horrible, right? But that's what sin does to us spiritually. We don't feel the, the pain we need to feel to be healthy spiritually and emotionally and relationally. It kills our ability to sense anything. Sin enables us, it, it, it enables us to avoid or deaden spiritual pain. What do you think we're doing when we're eating that donut? Sorry, Karen. You know, she brought donuts this morning. Now, I'm not saying donuts are bad, but let's all, how many have eaten a donut for comfort now and then to deaden the pain or take a drink, you know, or smoke cannabis or do whatever you do? How many ways do we have in our culture to deaden the pain, to numb the pain? It's all around us. We're slowly and surely being desensitized by sin in our lives. Take a look at Ephesians. So I tell you this, insist on the Lord that you must no longer live as Gentiles do in the fertility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and a continual lust for more. 
The ultimate end of all sin is the complete loss of our spiritual pain receptors so that we're unaware of how we're hurting ourselves spiritually. But we're also killing our spiritual joy receptors. Just as I can't experience pain, I can't experience spiritual pleasure either. And so what I do to myself when I sin, I, I, I destroy my ability to enjoy God, to enjoy relationships, to enjoy all the ways that God has given us to experience healthy pleasure in this life. And what happens? Because I don't feel good in the good ways, I have to find other ways to make myself feel better. And then I have to find more and more until, you know. By the way, there's brain chemistry that proves this. We keep doing drugs that keep doing stuff in our brain, and it keeps getting, we're destroying our brain's ability to enjoy normal life. It's just how drugs, alcohol, and addiction works. And, uh, and so, and then, in the same way, sin alienates us and separates us from God and one another. We become separated from each other. The more we descend into sin, the more we are unpleasant to be around, right? And the more we become contagious, the more we hurt those around us, or, or the more we drive people away from us. It separates us so that we are alienated. And, you know, I've heard some people say, you know, hell wouldn't be so much a bad place if you can be with your friends. You know, have you ever heard that? Yeah. The problem is, in hell, you won't be with your friends. You won't be related to anybody. It's isolation. The only person you'll know how to relate to is yourself. And that's what's scary about hell. It's not a punishment that God inflicts upon us. It's a punishment we've inflicted on ourselves because we've killed that part of our spirit that opens us up to a life outside ourselves. That's what spiritual leprosy is. You ready for some good news? <laughs> yeah, praise. Are you depressed enough now? Okay. Well, the good news, it, Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 2 to say this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. Praise God. You know, back to our story. First off, Jesus is not repulsed or repelled by our sin. We don't have to worry about him rejecting us or walking away from us. Secondly, he's willing. He wants to heal us. He wants to touch us. He, you know, he died on the cross to obliterate sin in our lives. Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And third, just like the, Jesus, uh, the leper, Jesus touched the leper, he wants to touch us. It's interesting how in that culture, it was believed that touching an uncomplete, uh, it was believed that when you touch an unclean person, it makes you unclean. Okay, does that make sense? If you touch something unclean, you become unclean. Something interesting happens here with Jesus. Okay, Jesus touches an unclean person. He doesn't become unclean. He makes the unclean person clean. Blow that, you know, think around that. And uh, it's just amazing. A guy by the name of Walter Wink said, the it's, a it's a reverse contagion. Yeah? And, and Walter Wink says this, a contagion of Christ's holiness overcomes the contagion of sin's uncleanness. And that's the good news. When Jesus touches us, we don't affect him. He affects us. I want to be touched by him every day. I want him to touch me all the time. I want to experience him so that I can reflect him. That's how that works. And uh, Isaiah 53, surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows or diseases Yet we're considered him, we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Wow. Now, there's something to be prepared for. And this catches Christians off guard so many times. As we experience God and reflect Christ, we experience healing, but guess what happens? we get our feelings back. Our receptors begin res become restored. What that first means is you're going to begin to experience spiritual pain again. And at that point, Christians go, I don't want to feel pain. I become more sensitive to guilt. I become more sensitive to shame. I, all the stuff that I was medicating come back. Oh, I feel this now. But now, 
I have another way of dealing with all that stuff through Jesus. We were talking about that this morning, weren't we, Jeff? We're like, when all the bad stuff, we take it to Jesus. We pray. If, I, if I'm experiencing shame, I don't have to numb it. I go, Jesus, I'm feeling shame. You're forgiven. I touch you. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to be sorrowful. You don't have to be fearful. You don't have to be resentful. You don't have all that negative stuff. But we are going to feel the pain. We just have to deal with it in a different way. And we have a solution. It's in Jesus we'll definitely feel more pain. And uh, I'll also feel the pain of others. I become more sensitive to those around me. The more I was in my sin, the more I could care less what's going on with you. I just didn't know. I don't know what's going on with my wife, my kids, you know, because I'm into myself. But when we become spiritually healed, I become more sensitive to those around me. Oh, man, they're hurting. They're feeling it. That's a good thing. It means we can love again. We can receive love and we can love others. And there's an upside. So just as we begin to experience pain anew, we now get to experience joy and pleasure anew, spiritual pleasure. I can now experience real peace and joy and spiritual gratification in God. You know, we, this is our motto, experiencing God, reflecting Christ. I know there's people who look at that and go, I don't get it. I, what's the big deal about experiencing God, reflecting Christ? Well, the fact that you don't get it is part of the desensitization that you're undergoing. And I got to tell you, those of us who've been healed a little bit, the more you grow, the more that becomes a big deal, and the more that becomes a big deal. And you're like, I want more of this. But when we first come, we go, I don't understand that. What, experiencing God? Man, when you feel bad enough, when you get so low and you can't stand it anymore, you're ready to, you know, we'll talk about it in a second. This becomes more important. And so <laughs> we are becoming alive. We're being made alive and we're beginning to experience a whole new life in Christ. And, and that's what's so great about this miracle of healing of leper. Jesus can heal us of our spiritual leprosy. So let me close with this. So what do I need to do? What's my part? Well, look again at what the leper did to receive this miracle. First off, he didn't deserve it, didn't earn it. I mean, you know, he's a leper. What could he do? So the first thing he did, he came to Jesus, knelt before him, complete humility. He took a position of complete and utter, you know, humility before Jesus. Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. That's the first thing. We just need to get over ourselves, let go of the pride, humble ourselves, and just come to the God who is there, who created us. That's a big step for most of us. But secondly, this leper came in faith. I mean, he says, if you're willing, you can heal me. He had no doubt in his mind that Jesus could do this. He wasn't sure about his willingness, but he knew he had the power to do it. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Hebrews 4.16 says it this way, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So there's two, that's, what, that's our part. Come humbly before Jesus in faith and ask him to heal our lives. And maybe that's what you need to do. And maybe today, like the leper, you need to come and kneel before Jesus and say, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And if that's the prayer you need to pray, and please do. And let me encourage you to come up and talk to me or Mike or one of the other leaders. Becky would be willing to talk to you. If you're needing that miracle in your life, come talk to someone. Share it with somebody. Share it with someone who will lead you and help you. Don't keep it to yourself. Amen? Let's all be standing for a closing word of prayer. Father, you are an awesome God. Your miracles are mind-boggling. But Father, help us to understand how the spiritual side of this is so much greater. And that's where it's relevant to our lives today. Help us understand how sin is desensitizing us and help us to more quickly come to you for the healing we need. Help us not to have to go to the very, very lowest rung of human society to, you know, hit bottom to feel our need for you. Wise us up. Help us to see our need for you now so that we may come before you and experience this great gift. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks, Doug. That was good stuff right there. I loved it. Hey, any